Now, is that common sense? I mean, do you even know what I'm talking about? You know, it's, a, it's not common sense. Is it sense experience? No, it's got nothing to do with sense experience. So is it all rubbish? Well, I don't know. I get the new scientist every week and it's full of this stuff. So you, you could just call it the new rubbish journal, perhaps. <laughs> that would be rather, you know, extreme thing to do and say that scientists are all talking rubbish. There are some people who'd say that's true. I mean, that science is putting things in test tubes and shaking them around. In other words, what you can do experiments with, that's what science is. But cosmology, talking about the, the Big Bang and the origins of the universe, that's not science anymore. But there wouldn't be many scientists who'd say that, really. Uh, and people like Steven Weinberg, who actually wrote a book called The First Three Minutes. And if you ask the first three minutes of what, the answer is the first three minutes of absolutely everything. And he can tell you in detail what happened in the first three minutes. Well, for David Hume, he, uh, that would be an impossibility. You couldn't do that. So how are people like Vern Weinberg doing it? They're doing it by, not by looking at sense experiences very hard. That wouldn't get you anywhere in science. What they're doing is constructing theories to explain how things like background cosmic radiation exist now and how it is that the stars look as though they're um, accelerating away from us, how it is that the universe looks the size that it does look, uh, why it is that there's a red shift in the stars. Uh, things like that need explaining, and it's explanation which leads you to talk about the origin of the universe as consisting in a rapid inflationary moment from uh, a point of infinite density and mass, the Big Bang. So something that nobody could possibly observe is accepted by almost all scientists as just a fact. The argument about steady state theory versus the Big Bang is over. I better be careful because by the time I finish this lecture, it might have started again. But uh, at the moment, uh, the issue seems to be resolved and certainly it's something that uh, cosmologists can talk about. Now, my point is simply that Hume's philosophy cannot cope with this. It can't say anything about it. It ought to be impossible. So on Humean grounds, anything but the, the simplest forms of empirical science, that is, you look at something and you look at a liquid and see whether it turns red or green, you know, and that's all you can do. But you can't ever explain string theory or quantum theory. What on earth would David Hume say about quantum theory? That, that electrons are probability waves in Hilbert space. Can you observe them? Absolutely not. There's no way. No way you can observe them. So what are you talking about? Remember what John Locke said? Knowledge consists in nothing but the detection of the resemblance uh, or disresemblance between ideas. Well, which ideas are not resembling each other when you talk about probability waves in Hilbert space? In other words, modern science is much more platonic than Humean. You might not like the word platonic, but at least it's much more committed to the fact that mathematics tells you the truth about the world. And it tells you that the truth about the world is that we cannot possibly picture it. And one of the things that goes wrong with empiricist philosophy is that it thinks all the things that you can know about and all the things that are true are things you can picture in your mind. Whereas what modern science tells you is that that is probably the most false statement you could ever make because things that you can picture in your mind are almost certainly false. You do, in, when you picture things in your mind, say you picture the Big Bang. Uh, well, a good example is I went to the um, uh, astro uh, radio astronomy laboratory in Cambridge, uh, and you've seen pictures produced by radio astronomy, and they're beautiful pictures of galaxies and stars, and they're, they're very, very nice. And I thought I might see some of these things, uh, and I, I went along. I was a bit surprised at first because there was nothing there but a large field with some aerials in it. I mean, it was radio astronomy. I should have realized that, really. But there were just a lot of aerials there. There weren't any telescopes. And then there were some computers. So I said, well, look, where are these pictures? And they said, oh, they're computer generated. And I said, well, um, look, uh, do they look like that, all these wonderful galaxies? And they said, of course not. They don't look like that. That's just to help you to see what they might be like. What we actually get are radio waves. It's not visible light that we're looking at here at all. And so that was a lesson straight away that radio astronomy does not tell you what stars look like. What it does is produce uh, computer-generated images uh, which would tell you what the stars would look like if you were able to look at them, which you're not. 
I mean, there are some visual telescopes as well, but the point is this, that computer-generated facts are these days as real as real facts. Well, we all know that. I saw a film uh, on television recently about Attila the Hun. Uh, and in this uh, film, there were thousands of warriors, Huns, fighting thousands of Romans. But actually, there was only one person fighting. The rest were all computer-generated. It was amazing, and it had all been generated from this one figure. So, you know, you can generate these simulated things, and uh, that's how a lot of science goes. What we get when we look at the results of science are simulations of what things would look like if they were visible, but they're not. So, you probably know that in 2008, which is this year as I speak, there is going to be a crucial experiment at CERN uh, in Geneva, which will probably end the universe. Well, we have to wait and see whether it does. Um, it won't take long, however, uh, if it happens. Uh, and the idea is that they're going to accelerate particles uh, in such a way that they could conceivably create a black hole. And that could conceivably swallow us all up. Uh, but it will be fairly painless. It'll be so quick. Um, so we'll probably never discover if it's true, but we will discover if it's false. <laughs> so it's falsifiable. Uh, another uh, suggestion about that experiment is that it may result in time travelers coming from the future and taking advantage of uh, some wormhole that they've established. Well, you know, what am I talking about? Who knows? Am I talking about anything sensible? Well, it's in the New Scientist this week. My point again is Hume cannot deal with all this. He's got no way of dealing with it because he's limited to a world of sense perceptions. Sense perceptions, they're not even commonsensical. Because common sense believes in an external world of objects. The strange thing is, the external world of objects that common sense believes in is not the world of objects that science lives in. It's a different world. The common sense world is one like these uh, simulated pictures of uh, faraway galaxies. That is, it's what you imagine you would see if you could look at them. But actually, you can't look at them. There's no way you can look at quarks or at uh, photons. You use photons to look at things, but uh, you can't really look at them, or you can't see what they're like, but you can draw pictures of them. So we have to get away from the idea of picturing, of imaging, of sense experience, and we have to talk about mathematical equations. Paul Dirac, great quantum physicist in Cambridge, said, the reason I chose the equations of quantum theory that I did choose is because they are the most beautiful and elegant that I could think of. Not because he saw them, you know, mathematical equations can't be seen. And if you ask the question, what do mathematical equations in quantum physics represent? The truth is, nobody knows. They work. Now, you may say that's pragmatism again, you know, we just accept them because they work. But that's not quite true. You don't accept a mathematical theory in quantum physics just because it works. You really do think it's true, but I don't know what it represents. That is to say, I can't picture it. My understanding has gone a long way beyond my sense experience. So the whole of modern science is a feat, a brilliant feat of intellectual understanding, which has begun from some sense experiences, but which has gone a long way beyond sense experience, and which in the end replaces sense experiences almost entirely by saying the nature of reality is very different from anything that we actually experience. So Hume must be radically wrong <coughs> in thinking that all knowledge is confined to experience because modern science shows that actually almost no knowledge in science is confined to experience. Certainly that would be true of cosmology and quantum physics. Right? So you've got to realize the way in which science has outdated empiricism completely. And that's a nice little ironic story because the logical positivists who tried to follow Hume thought that they were supporting science. They thought that all these metaphysical high-flown facts that people like Plato talked about could be abolished by simply positive attention to experiences. And that was the bedrock of science. But they were totally wrong. That is not the bedrock of science. The bedrock of science is the equations, Schrodinger equations, which tells you what happens in... Uh, the causal sequences of subatomic phenomena. And they deal in things that we can't imagine, that we can't picture, that few of us can understand, but they are understandable. So understanding has a place. When Hume says our conclusions about reality are not founded on any process of understanding, 
He's as wrong as anybody could ever possibly be. Almost all our conclusions about reality are founded precisely on processes of understanding. What modern science insists upon, of course, that that understanding must be checked by observation, but not that it should be limited to observation. 